And then, you know, how I deliver it, if it's in a container or in a function or, you know, in a controller, like an API app, uh, you know, doesn't matter, right? It's still the isolation, that logical isolation. So I was smiling because there was a there was a picture of Magnus popped up there who's obviously looking at the live stream questions. That's a really Hi, awesome Magnus. Question. Nice to see you too. Imagine those times when you have a uh, large monolithic application and everybody's afraid to touch that one line of code because they don't know all the places it's touched, right? So, so a lot of times when we do migrations or transformations of a code base, that's the number one problem is either the code is no longer known or understood by anybody or it, the one person that understood it left the company uh, or, you know, it's understood, but nobody really knows the whole picture. So we have to now figure out all the touch points so that we can actually make the transformation toward a microservice architecture. Barry, Barry seems to struggle with the fact that I look like Gandalf the White. Um, I, and I, I no, no, you really like prog rock, Barry. <laughs> you look like a Walmart version of Gandalf the White. Not sure Rick, how to take that one. Rick, Rick the Rouge, perhaps. I could live with that one. I yeah. could, I could live with that one. So, I, I am um, paid to be grumpy. <laughs> I am paid to be grumpy and say no to absolutely everything, and then try and figure out a way to say yes in such a way that things will be secure by default um, and easy to use and keep secure. Um, in that. In web applications, you cannot use binary formatter anymore. Binary formatter is um, a very old serialization technology that is horrendously insecure and we cannot make secure. Uh, we can't make secure without breaking all of its compatibility. So we're just like, okay, you have better options for serializing stuff, um, use those. The problem with binary formatter is it's insecure deserialization method because the payload takes the um, names of the objects that it wants you to create along with it. So if there are fun objects in the framework, and my favorite one is the temporary file collection, you could spit that into binary uh, formatter deserialize and delete random files on disk. Um, Web.config is my favorite because that brings down SharePoint, which always makes me giggle. And when we started to talk about mentoring, I was like, I had so many doubts, like I had no idea what does it actually mean? But yeah, of course, let's try it. And I also remember that you sent me a couple of uh, conferences to submit to, like to just have a look if I want to, to speak there. And I also remember that uh, the first of them was Global Asia. And that's actually how we got an idea for this talk. Uh, when I submitted my conference, uh, my, my talk to a Global Asia conference, um, we had this um, body program from uh, Global Asia, when you kind of like officially my mentor. Uh, and that's what we, how we, when we started to think how we can actually share this experience, uh, like the mentoring program. Global Asia, they're actually saying, okay, if you want a body, uh, if you're a new speaker, uh, Global Asia wants to help this over there as well. So Annie, you can probably tell a bit more about this part. There's the link that you can find out more and, and dive deeper into the body program. But really what it is, as, as you mentioned, Elder, it's, it's a really great program from Global Azure um, to really help people find mentors and mentees and really get uh, the community even more uh, running better, smoother and, and making those connections there and to get that the power of mentorship, particularly looking for mentees, which is usually uh, it's usually the other way around in mentorship programs. So this is a rare chance to truly get uh, a really great mentor. Um, so highly recommend to check that out from that link there. One thing I would definitely say, like I would say to anyone, uh, always try to go out to these social calls. Like we are all virtual, of course, so it's different than when we're in person, when you could go to meetups and meet people there. But there's still a lot of social calls going on and virtual meetups as well. Like just, uh, and don't go there just to find a mentor or a mentee, but just to get to know people, I would say. I think the barrier is a bit lower to do it virtually, like you can do it on chat or something like that, which is a little bit lower barrier than actually having to talk to someone and asking this in person, I think. I think so I think there's like uh, upsides and downsides to both of them. Yeah, at that point, that was a great segue, actually. We, will, we want to give a quick shout out to Mirza, who's saying hi from Indonesia. Um, Elder and Elena, you're in completely different countries, aren't you? So, I mean, this is a great example of how how the virtual communities that we've had to build in the past 12 months are actually removing those geographical barriers and enabling this. 
and to the organizers of uh, Global Azure LATAM. Um, it's a really, really great to see that they are the largest single community under the Global Azure banner this year. They've got, I think, 62 sessions. Great opportunity. Um, and we are very excited because, I mean, as Luis said, this is a joint effort between all the Latin communities. I'm from Nicaragua. Luis is from Mexico, Lautaro. One of my friends is from Ar Argentina. So, I mean, uh, with this COVID-19 pandemic situation, it's been very, very, uh, it's been more easier, you know, to join efforts between different countries and we share the passion for the .NET technologies and Azure. So we met each other because uh, we were, hey, do you know this? Do you know that? And we were kind of talking. On and the important thing about it is that this is another language. Uh, we know that almost every documentation is in English and now we are having different kind of language not too much as us speak English, so it is important to us to generate content in Spanish. And that's the idea when we gather in a lot of communities across all Latin America in this occasion. To me, this has been the first time we could, be, we could do that. We, we learn a lot and we are really happy and we are looking forward to organize um, other events, of course, Global Azure uh, stays forever, let's say, in our hearts, so we would like to continue with this. In order to shift into the digital space, we need more uh, tech practitioners. It can be DevOps, Ops, IT people, developers, you know, everything. Uh, people that can help uh, design the product as well, UI, UX. There's a huge need for, for people to, to build this product. Uh, we want to see the people that we're interacting with, right? So now we have this huge audience at home, right, everyone? Um, but we can't see them and it's 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 hard you know for us because we want to see the people that, that we're we're interacting with i i personally hope uh, it will be a hybrid solution uh, where we can still meet people uh, online uh, because it opens a lot of doors for everyone uh, it's helped so many people you know that can't attend or can't afford uh, traveling to conferences um but we will see <laughs> so we, we do a lot of things in order to assess usability so i'm going to describe a few activities and it's not all but one of the things that we do for example every time that we have a new design idea whatever that is every single week we run usability studies so even even on an idea that is on a paper we bring we have like multiple tiers of studies that we do so we have ones that are like the quick studies where basically we can get very quick feedback about uh, an experience and then kind of like see, you know, since we have, since we run those every week, we can have a lot of signals if we wanted to. Of course, before getting to that stage, we look a lot of kind of like usage data and feedback that we get from multiple channels from everyone. We do not always create the portal infrastructure. There is a world-class infrastructure that runs these types of workers, right? It's one of the largest single page applications in the industry. Also, we create a development a framework that other teams across Microsoft use and hosting platform where we can host the code that they write and we can give them like different hosting capabilities, telemetry, experimentation, all the services that I was mentioning. So I, I don't have like a number in my head, but I would say that from the usage, between 20 and 30% is within the portal organization, the rest might be distributed. That, that's a fantastic question. And I think the thing that I'm super excited about right now, and I would like to call everyone that is in the audience to to reach out because we are on a journey to make it simpler to make things like easier to use i mean we've been on that journey but we want to accelerate that journey and to do that we need to learn from you what are the things that you do where the tools get in the way and how can we make them better so i would love to hear from everyone that is watching this what are the scenarios where the tools are getting in their way and make and what can we do to make them better um another a scenario where durable functions are better are long-running workflows. So what's a long-running workflow? Well, long-running workflows are exactly like what they sound, right? Long-running is something that uh, I like to say is just longer than the time span of the request. So 
you know, uh, to put a silly example for it, uh, if you're in the middle of a Filipino party eating this delicious lumpia and uh, you see how the party is going, you know, has karaoke started yet? Uh, are people, are all the uncles getting super drunk and starting to sing the really bad karaoke songs? Uh, you kind of estimate how long they're going to be singing this karaoke, so you'll have to decide, do I need to make some more lumpia to feed them because they're going to be hungry a little bit later? But uh, this is a silly example to say, this is a very long running um, request. This is a long running thing that keeps going and you want to keep track of what is happening there. In these kinds of scenarios, uh, we were feeling the pain of, you know, we know we can't use something that's quick and easy where you just spin it up and uh, do the process because there are so many steps in this process. And so that's why durable functions, although, you know, it's not that you can't use them, they're just better for other things. And in this particular case, they definitely helped because of the way that our, our problem was uh, structured. <laughs> Hello, Jonah. Thank you. Lumpia is amazing. Lumpia is great. <laughs> it's very easy to get overwhelmed and say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm too dumb for this, or I don't understand this, or I don't, this is too much for me. And I want to kind of try to get rid of that kind of thinking because that happens to everybody no matter what stage you are in your career uh, there's always something new to learn and I guarantee you most people feel that way at least in the beginning but if you're able to power through that feeling um, for me that to do that is to use these kinds of examples uh, then I think that's that's the bigger lesson here is to try to find what works for you uh, and um, one of the best highlights that I still have from the lockdown period of conferences I did was I did a conference that was held inside the Animal Crossing game and so that was very novel that was exciting that was something I said I no matter what I want to make sure I write an amazing abstract so I get accepted into this talk because I want to speak at something like this and uh, it did very well and it was very difficult to manage slides and my Nintendo switch to move my character at the same time so it looks like I was talking in game and, and all of that but um, it was a very fun experience <laughs>